Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode of Coffee and Crimes. I'm your host, Tyler Grafon Rebic. Yes, yes, I know it's been a long time, hasn't it? In fact, it's uh, been a pretty eventful uh, last few weeks since uh, the last time we released uh, the one about uh, Bobby Joe Long. Um, let's see, some great things have happened. Uh, I got married. Um, I had a wonderful honeymoon in Murfreesboro, Arkansas. Absolutely beautiful. Didn't find any diamonds. Found a ruby, though, so that was always a plus. Um, also, I was uh, honored with the uh, commission as a Kentucky colonel. So, yes, you can call me Colonel. Feel free. I will not turn you down if you do. Um, <clears throat> today, we're going to be talking about uh, Donald Henry Gaskins, the meanest man in America, also known as Pee Wee. And uh, this is going to be a dark episode, from what I hear. I've skimmed over this case in the past. I read his book. I wish I hadn't, because I had to, like, bleach my eyes afterwards. Uh, but, yet yeah, here we are again. <laughs> So, um, I'm, 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 thank you for uh, checking in. If you want, please do like and subscribe. Um, if you have watched my other videos and stuff, I appreciate it if you would like and subscribe on those as well. If you subscribe to one video, you subscribe to all of them. But moving on, moving on. Um, and right now I've got this wonderful cup of breakfast coffee, breakfast roast. Good stuff, good stuff. It's... Uh, it's really good, actually. I've been uh, testing it out the last few uh, the last few days. It's been really good. So, you know, as usual, we're going to put in our sugar. Yeah, so, how's everybody been out there? I hope everyone's been doing good. Um, as you obviously you can tell, I've been doing pretty good as well. Um, it was really good to tie the knot finally, and uh, especially after so long of being together, and uh, you know. Just counting down the days. Now the days have been counted down. The time happened. And uh, my rabbi came all the way out from uh, Minnesota to do the wedding. Yeah, I live, we, as, as told in the previous video, I live out here in the south of Oklahoma. So it was quite a distance for him to show up. But he did. And the wedding was beautiful. It was beautiful. Probably the first Jewish ceremony done in this area since... Uh, before Moses was walking the earth. So, yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, it was real beautiful, beautiful ceremony, everything. Uh, family was there. Family came from all over the country to be here. Um, it was really beautiful. And I have so many wonderful things to say about it. Uh, but you're not here to hear about my personal life. So let's go ahead and uh, get on with the story. Get on with the uh, case. What makes a serial killer? Could it be a shitty childhood? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, that tends to be a pretty big uh, precursor in a lot of the episodes we've had in the past. A uh, case of bad economy? Well, who knows, really? Nature versus nurture? Pro probably both. Uh, I don't friggin' know. Well, <laughs> they don't know either. Uh, today's uh, case is on Donald Henry Gaskins, the meanest man in America. What caused Gaskins to be a serial killer? And what caused him to be the way he was? You be the judge. Oh, okay, I guess there was no answer to that question. It's just, uh, uh for your approval. What is that, Rod Ron, Ron, Ron Sterling from the, uh, Twilight, from, uh, the Twilight Zone? Submitted for your approval. <laughs> uh. Once more into the darkness. Early life. Donald Henry Parrott was born in Florence County, South Carolina on March 13, 1933 to Yulia Parrott. That's not Yulia like Y-U-L-S-E-U-L-E-A. So I'm assuming it's Yulia. Uh, or Eula, probably. He was the last of several children born to Eula and different men. Eula was an abusive sex worker who had been married several times. Gaskin's father, a wealthy gambling man with a penchant for young girls, later gave his son his surname, so he became Donald Gaskins. At a year old, Gaskins drank a bottle of kerosene that had been left out and began to experience convulsions until he was three. Oh, God. I can't imagine what that would do to you. I mean, he's lucky he lived. 
Well, I say he's lucky he lived. I mean, well, it's lucky anybody lives after that. But this guy, I'm assuming, probably it wasn't a good thing that he lived. But Gaskins was beat often by his mother, stepfathers, and other relatives. He was petite and small as he aged. And his, uh, everyone began to refer to him as Pee-wee. Well, but that was really good for his, uh, for his uh, confidence. Gaskin's mother would humiliate him in several sexual ways and pimp him out to her many boyfriends and clientele. Gaskin's poor social skills, lack of understanding, and learning disabilities became too great, and he dropped out of school at the age of 11. He teamed up with two local boys, Danny Smith and Henry Marsh, forming their own little trio called the Trouble Trio. I'm assuming that's what they were called. I don't know if they called themselves that, but I'm assuming that's what they were called by the locals. The trio spent the next few years vandalizing properties, burglarizing businesses and residences with the help of Danny Smith's father, stole cars to visit brothels in the area, and took interest in sexually assaulting other boys and themselves, or cornholing them, as they said. This came to a halt when Gaskins and the others gang-raped the younger sister of Marsh. Oh, God. Despite threats and gifts for her silence, the sister told her parents, Yeah, duh, I would, yeah, I would too. This resulted in the parents of the girl beating their son to a pulp. Then drove to Gaskins' house, where, with the help of his mother and relatives, they hung Donald Gaskins upside down in the barn nude and proceeded to beat him with a belt until he was bloody and near death. Danny Smith, however, was spared this punishment when his father threatened to shoot anyone that came for his son, later taking him and moving away. Marsh's family eventually did the same. Oh. Well, I mean... I don't know. I, I, I'd be protective of my kid, too. But, I mean, if I found that I did that, I'd call the police, maybe? Let the authorities handle this? Don't just... You know, I guess this is, what, the 30s? The 40s? So I guess that justice system was a little different back then. I don't know. At the age of 15, Gaskins broke into a woman's house and attacked her with an axe, hitting her in the head. Damn, this escalated. The woman survived, and Gaskins was arrested and sentenced to five years in the South Carolina Industrial School for White Boys. No, that's not a joke. Back then, segrega segregation was rampant. It was also during the trial that Gaskins learned for the first name that his name was Donald and not Pee. Oh, my God. Yes, his family had never actually called him Donald. They had only stuck with the nickname Pee Wee for most of his early life. Can you imagine that? Wait until you're on trial to discover what your first name was? But that was a that was a shock. Gaskins was repeatedly raped and beaten in the reform school, with the diminutive Gaskins being declared property of an older boy. Gaskins was also traded sexually for cigarettes and favors, at one point being gang raped by twenty others at a time as punishment for fighting back. Oh god. I can already tell this this is not going to do good for his psyche. I mean, other than, you know, the early horrors that he received at the hands to like his from like his mother and in the kerosene and ugh. Gaskins escaped the school and went on the run several times. However, however, after marrying a 13-year-old girl named Mary, he voluntarily returned to finish his sentence. Crimes I mean, crimes. It sounds like he was already committing crimes. Gaskins was released in 1951 at the age of 18. He got a job at a construction site and did occasional repair work as a way to supplement his income. When Mary got pregnant, the couple moved to Georgetown, South Carolina to live with her family. Gaskins worked a government con contract logging cypress trees. This lasted until a friend from the reform school offered Gaskins work on his tobacco farm. The job included a truck and a three-bedroom house in Johnsonville. Which, John, which Gaskins couldn't, re, couldn't refuse and immediately took. Unfortunately, the hard labor and wages didn't appeal to Gaskins, and his friend introduced him to burning down farms for insurance payments by the, by the owners. On April 17, 1952, Mary gave birth to Shirley Gaskins. When his friend ended up getting arrested, a new farmer bought the farm he worked at and confronted him about his reputation as an insurance fraudster. 
Gaskins, angry at the confrontation, hit the woman with a hammer and sent her into a coma. Doesn't seem like a very friendly person. Gaskins attempted to flee, but was arrested and put on trial. Initially sentenced to five years in the state pen, he received an additional year after calling the judge a stupid son of a bitch. Yeah, you know, when you're in court and the judge sentences you, it's best to just shut up and be happy because they have the power to put additional time on there. But contempt of court is a real thing, people. Gaskins, at this point, had reached his maximum height of 5 foot 4 and weighed 130 pounds. Damn that short. Like me, I'm 6 foot 5. So that's like... That's like a whole foot and an inch low. That's like 13 inches smaller than me. Damn. Hell, I think my wife is taller than him. This would prove detrimental when he found himself in state prison and again being used for sexual favors. After being used for six months by a particular power man, Gaskins decided to end it by proving he wasn't a pushover anymore and attacked the most powerful inmate in the pen, Hazel Brazel? Hazel Brazel. Hazel Brazel. Slashing his throat and killing him. Despite not having a reputation and being given his own weaker slaves, Gaskins escaped the prison in garbage barrels after being informed that Mary was divorcing him. Once he got out, Gaskins made it to his cousin David Gaskins' shop and stole his cousin's truck. That's good coffee right there. Despite not finding his wife, Gaskins took a job with a carnival and traveled the country. During this trek, he married a woman named Junie Holden. This marriage only lasted two weeks before Gaskins' abuse caused her to flee in terror. Gaskins later became infatuated with a carny girl, or sorry, a carny woman named Betty Gates, who convinced him to travel to Tennessee to gift her incarcerated husband, gift her, sorry, to gift her incarcerated brother several packs of cigs. However, after Gaskins had returned to their hotel room. He discovered that Betty had absconded with his truck and left him stranded. The next day, Gaskins was arrested, as one of the packs contained a razor that her brother had used to escape with. Gaskins learned that he had actually been fooled, as Betty's brother was in fact her husband, and he had helped her break him out. Gaskins was brought in, charged with being a fugitive, helping a prisoner break out, and sent back to the pen with an additional six months. Another charge of assault hit him when he cut an inmate's ear off, and again, Gaskins was retried, this time in federal court, for stealing a car and driving it over state lines, netting him three years in a Georgia prison. While in Georgia prison, Gaskins was befriended by the infamous New York City mob boss, Frank Costello. On August 6, 1961, Gaskins was released at 28. He returned to his hometown of Florence and moved in with a cousin named Marvin, finding work as a mechanic. A local minister brought Gaskins on as part of his traveling ministry, but this only helped Gaskins back into burglarizing different houses on the route. Returning home and leaving the ministry, Gaskins married 18-year-old Jerry Delors in 1962. That same year, Gaskins molested a 12-year-old girl, which quickly got him arrested for statutory rape. Is he not already on some kind of a, like... Well, no, I guess not, because the only rape that he's committed thus far was the uh, that friend of his sister. Or his sister, or, sorry, the sister of his friend. So I guess I guess that would they, and they didn't call the cops on that. So while at a courthouse, Gaskins jumped out of a window and fell thirty feet to the ground without injuring himself. Whoa! I guess it's being short because I know if I jump thirty feet out of a window, I'd probably break both my ankles. Quickly stealing a county car, Gaskins got money from his mother and headed away. He abandoned the car in a lake and went on foot to the town of Dillon. There he stole another car and drove to Charlotte, North Carolina. Getting on a bus, he arrived in Raleigh, brought a car, bought a car, and made it back to Pembroke, North Carolina. While there, he married a 17-year-old Native American girl, Lanny Oxendine, and remained married for three months before she left for the storm and never came back. How is he marrying all these people? Don't they know he's on the run? He's a fugitive? I mean, you gotta go to a court. Even if he's not going to a, to a courthouse, they do need a, like a marriage license, don't they? I mean, they had those back then. How is he not getting arrested? 
Gaskins returned to his third wife, Jerry, reconciled, and they moved to Lake Wales, Florida to work the carnival, which proved to be a bust. Jerry quickly informed Gaskins she wanted a divorce, and he agreed to take her back to Florence. However, they were soon overcame by sirens after driving into Georgia, and Donald abandoned the car and Jerry in a swamp, escaping on foot. Jerry survived and was arrested, but released with no charges. Gaskins, now on the run, hopped a train for Savannah, Georgia. Once there, he cleaned up and caught a bus back to Pembroke to get back with Lenny. However, after putting him to sleep with sex, Lenny had a de deputy come and arrest Gaskins for the charge of statutory rape in Florence. After being on the run for nearly two years, he was sentenced to six years for the rape and two years for his escape in 1964. After four years, Gaskins was released on parole. How was he getting released? Gaskins was released on parole at 35 thanks to the efforts of the prison warden. The only condition of his parole was that he not enter Florence for two, Florence County for two years. How is that your condition, man? Don't let him out. Put him on the sex offenders registry. They had that back then, the 60s, right? Did they have that, did they have that back then? I don't know. Murders. Gaskins worked his construction jobs in Sumner South, South, Sumter, South Carolina. However, this was only a front, as he would rework and do paint jobs on chop shop cars to make more money. While doing a robbery with two teens, he found himself on the end of a knife by the, two, by the teen boys, who decided they want the loot and his money as well. Gaskins relented and returned home, where he grabbed his 32 Beretta automatic and forced the boys into a swamp, where he retrieved the loot, the burglarized items, and their clothes, swearing to murder them if he saw them again. Why would he take their clothes? Well, it's a freak. Gaskins began to feel the pain in his body and voices telling him to do acts of violence to relieve the pains. Gaskins, who had been traveling back and forth to Florence, even though he was not permitted to, and some to visit his ex-wife Mary and daughter Shirley, decided to travel the coastal highway between Myrtle Beach and Savannah looking for hitchhikers. In September 1969, Gaskins picked up a female hitchhiker named Angie in Polly's Island. After being turned down for sex, Gaskins beat her unconscious, raped her numerous times, bit off parts of her anatomy, stabbed her, and proceeded to weigh her down and throw her into a local river where she drowned. Oh, my. In October, Gaskins met a woman named Daisy from Jacksonville who was working, on, who was working in Myrtle Beach. He, pursue, he proceeded to do the same vile things to her and also drowned her in the river. Gaskins wrote that he killed nine to ten people in this way, calling them the coastal kills. He stated he killed them, men and women, every six weeks. However, these kills have never been corroborated or proved. On November 10, 1970, Gaskins offered to drive two drunk girls home from the bar. One was his 15-year-old niece, Janice Kirby, and the other, her 17-year-old friend, Patricia Allsbrook. Rather than driving to their home, Gaskins drove the intoxicated pair to his own home. There, Gaskins began to attempt to rape both girls. It's your niece, dude. Damn. But not that you should be raping anyone, but shit. Patricia managed to knock Gaskins down with a lamp, and both girls ran down a dirt road until Gaskins waylaid them in his car using a gun and forced them into the trunk. Afterwards, Gaskins returned them to his home where he raped both and savagely beat the girls to death. Isn't this guy like five foot nothing? How the hell is any, how the hell is he beating anybody up? I'm sorry. 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 He disposed of Allsbrook's body in a septic tank, and Kirby was buried behind an old farm on the family land. A month later, on December 18th, Margaret Peggy Catino, daughter of State Senator James Catino, went missing. Her body was found 12 days later in a wooded area off Highway 261. She had been killed by blows to the head and strangulation, whilst her body was covered in cigarette burns. Gaskins was opted for the murder, but a 39-year-old truck driver named William Jr. Pierce confessed to the murder and was sentenced to life. Gaskins' parole ended in 1971. Gaskins celebrated by marrying for a fifth time to a woman who was three months pregnant with his kid. She gave birth to his son, Donald Lee Gaskins. But I'd hate to have his name. 
On March 29, 1972, Gaskins visited an African-American woman named Martha Ann Dick for sex, and she informed him, perhaps jokingly, that he had impregnated her and she planned to name her baby Peewee Dick after him. Gaskins, who was virulently racist and disapproved of interracial children, forced her to consume pills he said would cause an, ab an abortion. However, the amount of pills she consumed ended up causing an overdose that killed her. Gaskins dumped Dick's body into a drainage ditch. People should know by now not to joke with this guy or, like, even communicate with him, because obviously he's a psycho. In June, Gaskins kidnapped 16-year-old Anna Culber Ann Culberson from Atlanta, Georgia. He tortured her for 96, 96 hours. What is that? Five days? No? 24? 48? I don't know, it's several days, and then killed her with a ball-peen hammer. He buried her in the same area that he had buried his niece, Janice Kirby. Four months later in October, Gaskins killed 18-year-old Jackie Freeman after raping her and eating part of her leg? He buried her not long after. Somebody needs to shoot this guy. Seriously, like. I'd start carrying a gun with me after finding out all these people were dead and stuff, and the first time he offered me a ride, it was like, bang. While living in Prospect, South Carolina, Gaskins bought an old hearse and would scare people by joking that any ride with him would be their last. See? There you go. There you go. There you go. Obviously, he's a lunatic. Most people knew Gaskins had an explosive temper and kept a wide clearance of him, but some considered him a friend. Until he proved them otherwise. In December of 1973, 22-year-old, excuse me, 22-year-old Doreen Dempsey was preparing to leave for a new life. She was unmarried with a two-year-old daughter named Robin and a baby on the way. Gaskins offered her a ride to the bus station, but instead he took her to a wooded area. Gaskins was extremely put off by Doreen, as her daughter Robin was biracial and she had been impregnated by another African-American man. Who cares, dude? Why, are you, why do you get so bent out of shape about this? Freak? Racist freak? Once they reached the area, Gaskins violently raped both Doreen and her daughter. Oh my god, that's awful. And her daughter. Drowning them both in a pond and burying them in the same grave. <sighs> Fucking asshole. In July of 1974, I'm sorry, that's horrible. That's fucked up. Fuck you, Donald Gaskins. I hope they, like, executed your ass. <sighs> Shit gets dark. In July of 1974, Gaskins raped and murdered two unnamed boys in a swamp. Later that, later that month, he raped and murdered his friend, 36-year-old Johnny Sellers, and did the same to Johnny's 22-year-old ex-girlfriend, Jessie Ruth Judy, out of fear she'd tell the police. He chained their bodies together and sunk them into a pond. I say again, how is this guy getting away with anything? He's five foot. Knock him over. He goes to attack you, attack him, beat his ass down. No, I'm going to start being weary of little people. Well, not, not, I'm sorry, let me take that back. Not little people, as in like, as in like, genital, congenitally short people like, like dwarfs. I'm talking little people like five foot, well, I guess anybody's little to me. Oh, fuck it, never mind, I'm sorry I said anything. Um... <clears throat> By 1970, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I did. I'm not. I was just joking. I'm just joking, everyone. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna start freaking out every time I see a short per, a shorter person. Just wow. <clears throat> By 1975, Gaskins was 42 and a grandfather. He was alleged to have killed 90 boys and girls throughout the North Carolina highways. In January, he encountered two 20-year-old female college students and their guy friend whose van had broken down. After forcing them at gunpoint to engage in group sex, Gaskins castrated the man 
and murdered both the women. Taking the van for himself, he used it for petty crimes for easy money. In February, Gaskins was paid $1,500 to kill a wealthy farmer named Silas Yates by the man's mistress, Suzanne Kipper, with a group of friends, John Owens, John, and John, John Owens, John Powell, and the ex-wife of his friend Walter, Diane Neely. The murder took place, Gaskins murdered Yates while the others watched. However, things started falling apart as Neely decided to blackmail Gas. What? To blackmail Gaskins for five thousand dollars. If you saw this guy literally but butcher someone, are you really gonna like? Even if you have a friend with you or several, are you really gonna like blackmail this guy? I mean, obviously he's explosive. The hell do you? Th the hell is wrong with you? Okay, that's one of those too stupid to live, I guess. Gaskins agreed to meet up and give the money to Neely and her boyfriend, Avery Howard. Gaskins showed up, no money in hand. He then brutally stabbed Neely to death after shooting Howard in the head. In September, Gaskins made advances to a neighborhood girl named Kim Gelkins, who was 13. She rejected him and threatened to tell the police. Gaskins kidnapped the girl, stabbed her to death, and disposed of her body. In October, 15-year-old Johnny Knight and 29-year-old Dennis Bellamy, both half-brothers and brothers of Diane Neely, robbed Gaskins at his repair shop. Gaskins offered to give the men some guns he had stolen, but instead he took them to the woods and murdered them both, burying their bodies with the assistance of his friend, Walter Neely. <sighs> this guy is fucking awful. Might be the worst person we've covered yet. Arrest and trial. Police had been investigating the disappearance of Kim Gelkins for a while, and while searching her home, they discovered clothes that Gaskins had worn. The police arrested Gaskins for contributing to the delinquency of a minor. Well, that's a bit of a stretch. While in jail, Walter Neely confessed to have been an accomplice to Gaskins' crime and led the police to the private cemetery Gaskins had made in Prospect. There, they uncovered the bodies of Johnny Sellers, Jesse Ruth Judy, Avery Howard, Diane Neely, Johnny Knight, Dennis Bellamy, Doreen Dempsey, and Robin Dempsey. On April 27, 1976, the coroner had verified the bodies as Neely had told, and Gaskins and Neely were charged with eight counts of murder. Next month, on May 24, the trial began. It took no more than four days for Gaskins to be found guilty of murder, and the first degree, he was sentenced to fry in the electric chair. Get him. However, in November, the sentence was was commuted, and Gaskins was given seven consecutive life sentences after the Supreme Court ruled the death penalty as unconstitutional. By April, of, okay, I, I, I'm I'm usually against. Okay, I won't say I'm against the death penalty, but fitting the crime, yeah, execute him. This guy needs to be executed. By April of 1977, the trial for the murder of Silas Yates was in motion, and by the end of it, Suzanne Kipper, John Owens, John Powell, and Gaskins were found guilty and sentenced to life. Gaskins took the stand and confessed to every single murder he had been accused of, along with several that weren't known at the time. He was going to prison forever, he might as well admit it. Gaskins was sent to the South Carolina Correctional Institution to serve for the rest of his life. Prison life was different now, as Gaskins was given a wide berth and plenty of respect, since he was known as a vicious serial killer. Papers called him the Hitchhiker's Killer and the Redneck Charles Manson. Isn't Charles Manson already a redneck? Or a hillbilly? How can you be the... Wait, wait. Charles Manson, like, had a group of people to do all this killing. This guy didn't have a group of people. This guy did everything himself. I, mean, I guess in, in terms of being scary, maybe he was scary like Charles Manson was, but I don't know. That's, that's kind of a stupid, kind of, kind of a stupid um, nickname. One more crime. While serving his sentence in the high security block, Gaskins was contacted by Tony Chimo, or Timo, the son of a local elderly couple named Bill and Myrtle Moon, who had been viciously killed during an armed robbery. Oh, I'm sorry, the grandson of a local elderly couple named Bill and Myrtle Moon who had been viciously killed during an armed robbery of their store. 
Simo made Gaskins an offer, cash for the death of fellow inmate Rudolf Tyner, who had killed Simo's grandparents. Gaskins attempted to poison Tyner's food and drinks before coming up with a viable way. Gaskins rigged a portable radio in Tyner's cell and told Tyner the radio would let them talk to each other. Tyner held the speaker to his ear as at the agreed time, and Gaskins detonated the C4 that was laden with, into the speaker, causing a blast that sent Tyner's body all over the cell. Oh my god. Gaskins later said, The last thing Tyner heard was me laughing. This guy's a fucking weird... Yeah, god, psycho. Simo was charged with the murder, but pled guilty to a lesser charge and was sentenced to eight years, getting out on parole in 1986. Or just getting out in 1986, sorry. Gaskins was tried for the murder of Tyner and sentenced to the newly reinstated death penalty. It was the first time in South Carolina that a white man was, con was sentenced to death for the murder of a black man. Really? Was that long? I'm sure. I'm sure, like... No disrespect to South Carolina, but I'm sure there had been some KKK killings at the, before then. I mean, that's... Well, that, I guess that's progress, that he would, that it was a white man sentenced to them. Sorry, that, that, that's terrible. It was also at this time that Gaskins was nicknamed the meanest man in America. I would think the, you know, double rape and murder of the woman and her child would have got him that title, but... Oh well. Death. While on death row, Gaskins claimed to have committed 100 to 120 murders, including that of Peggy Catino. However, these murders have been disputed and unproved. Gaskins spent the last few months of his life working with author Wil Wilton Earl on his book Final Truth, which was published in 1993. On September 5, 1991, Gaskins regurgitated a razor blade he had swallowed earlier and used it to slash his wrists as a way of postponing his execution. However, the wounds proved superficial, and Gaskins lived. Gaskins went to the electric chair hours late. How was he sentenced to death? Didn't they, didn't they already, like... Didn't they, didn't they don't have... Didn't, wait, did I miss something? Did they have the death penalty again? Oh, yeah, they reinstated the death penalty. Okay. As you can tell, I obviously don't pay attention. Gaskins went to the electric chair hours after his attempted suicide. On September 6, 1991, his final words were, I'll let my lawyers talk for me. I'm ready to go. And with that, Donald Henry Pee Wee Gaskins was executed. The only relative present at his execution was his son, Donald Lee Gaskins, who I hope later went on and changed his name. Final Notes Gaskins admitted to 110 murders, but he was only ever convicted of 15. Gaskins' daughter Shirley later appeared on an episode of Evil Lives Here, which was which was on the I, the ID channel, Information Discovery. Information Discovery. I think it's Information Discovery. One of the few friends Gaskins had was Charles Marvin Green Jr., who befriended Gaskins in '75. Green and Gaskins were friends until a falling out when Green knocked Gaskins upside the head. Later, Gaskins wrote to Green from prison, and years later, when the prison was being torn down, Green took his kids to see it and found Gaskins had drawn a pentagram on the wall with Green's name in the middle. Green later went on to have a loud and bipolar YouTube channel known as Angry Grandpa, where he did pranks and complained about everything before passing away. Rest in peace. That was honestly... Pretty friggin' rough. I feel like I need a shower after that one. Like that was almost that was worse than the Albert one. That was on par with the Albert Fish. The Albert Fish one was pretty bad. And and you know that one guy what was his name Dean Coral. Yeah, I still I still have nightmares about that one. Nightmares. I don't really have nightmares about anything. But it's pretty dark. It's a hell of a way to come back to though, right? Am I right? But, uh, honestly, I just want to say, um, hey, thanks for showing back up. Uh, this has been an episode of Coffee and Crimes. I've been your host, Tyler Goffin-Revick, and I will see you next time. <laughs>